Welcome to History at the OK Corral. History too real for the Westerns. Don't forget to click like, share, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and leave us a comment if you like this story. Warning, while it's never our intention at History at the OK Corral to be gratuitous, we feel sufficient description of the following events is warranted in order to bring full light to the subject and respect to the people involved. Tonight's story contains graphic content and very intense situations. Viewer discretion is advised. Tonight's episode, Hail in the High Sierras, The Donner Party. February 18, 1847, Truckee Lake, California. After two weeks traveling east through the rugged Sierra Nevada mountains and freezing temperatures, seven men rode into a clearing near the eastern shore of the isolated mountain lake. They were a rescue party sent out after a member of this group, a man by the name of William Eddy, had made a harrowing journey to the Sacramento Valley from this camp in order to contact the outside world and muster a rescue force. Now, as these men approached the camp, they began to call out for any survivors. At first, their cries were met with a deafening and chilling silence. A member of the rescue party, Daniel Rhodes, gave an account of what happened next. We crossed Truckee Lake on ice and came to the spot where we had been told we should find the immigrants. We looked all around, but no living thing except ourselves was in sight, and we thought that all must have perished. We raised a loud halloo, and then we saw a woman emerge from a hole in the snow. As we approached her, several others made their appearance in like manner coming out of the snow. They were gaunt with famine, and I never can forget the horrible, ghastly sight they presented. The first woman spoke in a hollow voice, very much agitated, and said, Are you men from California, or do you come from heaven? The people at this remote camp, many of them children, had endured unthinkable things. Many people today think they know the story of the Donner Party. A small group of unfortunate, foolhardy settlers who suffered the wages of their miscalculations by eating each other. It's seen as a story of misfortune, endurance, and ultimately, survival. And while all those things might be true in part, in whole, what the tale of the Donner Party is, is a horror story. See, many also think the party were ultimately found and rescued by fearless mountain men. This too is true in part, but it's not the whole story. This initial group of seven rescuers would be known to history as the First Relief, and they would be just the beginning of the last terrible chapter for those pitiable souls stuck at that lake in the middle of nowhere. But how did they get stuck there in the first place? The Donner Party was actually a collection of families, composed of men, women, children, and all their livestock and belongings, along with a number of single men that had hired on as help to drive the wagons and animals. The party was 87 people in total, more than half of which were children. They had originated as the Donner family, headed by husband George Donner and wife Tamsin Donner. With them were their three daughters, Frances, age six, Georgia, age four, Eliza, age three, and George's daughters from a previous marriage, Elitha, 14, and Leanna, 12. George's younger brother, Jacob, 56, also joined the party with his wife, Elizabeth, 45, Isaac, age 6, Louis, age 4, and Samuel, age 1. Also traveling with the Donner brothers were Teamsters Hiram O. Miller, Samuel Shoemaker, Noah James, Charles Berger, John Denton, and Augustus Spitzer. They were joined by the Reed family. Margaret, age 32, stepdaughter Virginia, age 13, daughter Martha Jane, age 8, sons James and Thomas, age 5 and 3, and Sarah Keyes, Margaret Reed's mother. The Reed family was led by James Reed, who will prove to be a seminal figure in this story. Reed was a relatively well-off furniture maker from Illinois with a fiery temper but a penchant for leadership. 
Unfortunately, Reed did not have a penchant for transcontinental navigation. He had read a book by a man named Lansford Hastings that advised those en route to California via the now famous Oregon Trail Route to take a cutoff through the deserts of Utah and Nevada. There were three major problems with this idea, though. One, Hastings had never actually taken the route himself. He had just studied a few maps and deduced it to be a more expedient route than the one many tribes and mountain men had trodden in some form or fashion for centuries. He was so confident in his route, Hastings published a book advising people to take it. Two, the area they went through was completely desolate, unforgiving desert, and they were woefully under-equipped and inept in the environment. And three, it, in fact, would later be found to be about 140 miles longer than the original route. So it wasn't a shortcut at all. But against the advice of their mountain man guide and the rest of their wagon train, the Reeds, Donners, and a number of others that they had convinced to go with them, including Levanna Murphy, a widow from Tennessee who headed a family of 13, Harriet Murphy Pike and her husband William M. Pike joined the party, and their daughters Naomi and Catherine also joined. Most of these kids are between the ages of 1 and 5 years old. The aforementioned William H. Eddy, a carriage maker from Illinois, had brought his wife Eleanor and their two children James and Margaret. The Breen family consisted of Patrick Breen, a farmer hailing from Iowa, his wife Margaret, and their seven children. And finally, there was the Kessebergs, Louis and his wife Elizabeth Philippine, and their son Louis Jr. Nearly immediately, the divergent group faced innumerable and seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Water was nowhere to be found, rations were sparse, and the landscape was not conducive at all to travel by wagon. The livestock often wandered off in search of food and water, and the routes initially proposed in either Hastings' book or by Reed himself were often impassable and had to be retraced. Numerous party members died along this trail, but the vast majority survived. However, compounding their leadership problems and splintering factions even further, by the time they reached the Sierra Nevadas, James Reed had been banished from the party. Reed had stabbed another man, John Schneider, in either the throat, chest, or stomach, according to different eyewitness accounts, during an altercation, bleeding the man out within seconds into the parched desert sands. In this land far removed from constitutional jurisdiction, the rest of the party were unsure what to do with Reed. Some suggested hanging him, but instead, they settled for banishing him from the party to make his way alone to California. Though this was in many ways a tacit death sentence, Reed would make his way over the Sierras and ultimately prove a saving grace to his family and estranged travel companions, though one could certainly be forgiven for pointing out that this whole situation may well be blamed on Reed and his ego in the first place. Now essentially leaderless, the party continued their ascent into the Sierras. The entire group held a palpable air of anxiety, knowing that they had been long delayed that anxiety soon rose to terror, as one morning the party awoke to a truly terrifying sight. Snow on the Sierra mountaintops. It had come early this year and rendered the Donner Party narrowly but fatally outside the window of opportunity to cross the nearly impassable Sierras with even a modicum of insurance that they would emerge alive on the other side. Still, there was little else to do but make a desperate push to get through hopefully before conditions got even worse. But things got worse. Worse in a way that no one on record had ever experienced before. The native tribes of the area knew better than to undertake such a fatal errand, but even they did not fully know just how bad the High Sierras were in the winter, at least not for any extended period of time. There was just no reason for anyone to ever be up there, they figured. And they were right. Soon, the party would be snowed in at Truckee Lake. They would construct small cabins with each family forming small mini camps within a few miles of each other. They would ration their food, dress their children as warmly as they could, and do their best to keep fires burning by continually venturing out to collect wood. That winter would be unusually harsh, not so much for its duration, but for its intensity. Snowstorm after snowstorm pounded the area 
with more than 20 feet of snowfall being estimated to have fallen. If you go to the campsite today, you can see old trees seemingly inexplicably cut off 20 feet in the air. These were where the Darnay party had cut them down. As with so much snow, only two to three feet of the enormous trunk would have remained visible to them. Ship's logs from San Francisco and Morro Bays note snow on the mountaintops that surrounded their coastal enclaves. The vast majority of those who died were men aged 18 to 39, followed by women in the same age group, as they died desperately searching for ways to keep their children alive. When they ran out of meat, they boiled bones. When they ran out of bones, they cut strips of ox hide and boiled those until a flavorless goo could be extracted. The children would be lined up and a spoonful placed in each of their mouths as they did their best not to reflexively gag up the only nourishment they had. They planned to hunker down here and wait out the worst of the Sierra winter. But whether they perished in the cold that year or made it out alive to the Sacramento Valley only to be haunted for the remainder of their days, for every single person at Truckee Lake, the winter of 1846 would not end in their lifetime. Because soon, there would be no more ox hide left to boil, no more food left to eat. And soon, people would begin to succumb to these ironically hellish conditions. Then, starving people would be confronted with two choices, do the unthinkable or die. It would ultimately take two months and four total rescue parties to retrieve anyone who had managed to survive that winter. Each trip required the party, whose motives also included rescuing the valuable goods left by the Donner Party's deceased, to scale thousands of feet in elevation at great peril to themselves. And each time a party arrived to bring more people out and more snow thawed, more and more of what had happened that terrible winter became apparent. By the time the fourth rescue party, or Fourth Relief arrived in April of 1847, the macabre scene that greeted them rivaled anything modern horror cinema has ever even come close to. Wandering their way through the camp searching for any valuables or survivors, they were first greeted with the horrible stench of flesh that had begun to putrefy in the warming weather. They came across the body of a young woman, slashed open and denuded of fatty tissue at the breast with arms missing large strips of flesh that had been deliberately filleted off. Her skull had been cracked open at the top, and all the brain tissue had been scooped out. Two more heads were found in similar condition. Then another body, this one of Mrs. Donner, lying similarly butchered but identifiable. Then, they came across the cabin of Lewis Kesseberg. The following is an eyewitness account given by one Captain Fallon, who was the first to lay eyes on Kesseberg that day. Upon entering, discovered Kesseberg lying down amidst the human bones, and beside him a large pan full of fresh liver and lights. They asked him what had become of his companions, whether they were alive, and what had become of Mrs. Donner. He answered them by stating that they were all dead. Mrs. Donner, he said, had, in attempting to cross from one cabin to another, missed the trail and slept out one night. That she came to his camp the next night very much fatigued, he made her a cup of coffee, placed her in bed, and rolled her well in the blankets, but the next morning found her dead. They asked Kesseberg if the contents of the frying pan in his cabin were indeed the liver and brains of Mrs. Donner. Kesseberg replied enthusiastically that they were. When his interrogators asked why he did not eat the bit of beef that the third rescue party had left him, actually James Reed had left it for him, he came back, bathed Kesseberg, combed his hair, and gave him some food to hold him over until this last fourth relief could come and rescue him. Kesseberg replied that it was not nearly as sweet as human meat, and the liver was the tastiest bit of human of all not to be skipped in favor of boring, old, too dry beef. Kesseberg was ultimately rescued and returned to society to live an ostracized existence, though the rest of the survivors were not harshly shamed as they were seen to have taken no glee in what they were forced to do. 
another cleanup party of sorts would come in the months later after the fourth relief. They would dig a huge pit in the middle of one of the cabins, put all of the earthly pieces of the unfortunate souls who had perished here on this lonely shore into it, and burn it all to ashes. They hoped, with the last of the smoke and embers, to extinguish as best they could the horrific memories of what had happened in this place. But they would not. Today, in the campsite where so much horror occurred, there is a museum and a monument to what occurred there in the winter of 1846. And, of course, Truckee Lake, upon whose shores the desperate party had sought refuge and endured something as close to hell as almost any human beings in history, is no longer Truckee Lake. Today, it's known as Donner Lake. Now, what we've covered tonight is but a small slice of the entire story of the Donner Party. There's the stories of James Reed and his multiple desperate attempts to save his family. There's the equally harrowing and horrifying tale of the Forlorn Hope, the group who set out from the Donner Camp in search of rescue. There's the stories of the lives the survivors lived and the traumas they dealt with or at times succumbed to. All are tales worthy of their own episodes. But for tonight, those are stories for another time. And before we go, if you're anything like me, you probably don't have as much free time as you'd like to kick back, relax, and crack open one of the many books on your shelf that you bought and planned to read, but just haven't found time to get around to yet. Thankfully, I found Audible, the unrivaled audiobook platform. It allows me to do most of my research for this program directly from their app. If you're interested in doing your own deep dive on any of these topics that we've covered here on the podcast or any of our other podcasts, check out my reading list on alldamnnight.com. Every title listed there is available on Audible as well. Sign up for Audible using our link in the description or use promo code ALLDAMNIGHT in the checkout. That's promo code all damn night. You'll get your first month completely free, and that includes a credit for any audiobook you choose. Join Audible, and you'll hear what you've been missing.